How was I to know that she was in disguise, never showing all her union cards? Guess I should have known that I'd be compromised if I lowered my national guard. She said she liked to cook and I liked to eat, so I followed her home to her high rise. Sat there playing with her parakeet while she mixed us a couple of my ties. Then my hair stood up, my toenails curled when her parakeet sang, We are the world. There's a Von euch, weil wir der Überzeugung sind, dass die Bande dieser Volksgemeinschaft sich niemals und nirgends lösen. Das, was ihr denkt in dieser Stunde, das, was euch erfüllt, dessen wollen wir nun laut gedenken. Unsere teure Heimat, unser teures deutsches Reich, zieht ein! That was the voice of Adolf Hitler, the most ferocious dictator the world has ever known. For 13 years, he led a reign of terror. And during that period, his public appearances created a state of mass hypnosis among his many followers. His speech over, the crowds would shout, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil, and then break forth into joyous song. Deutschland über alles, Germany over all. That was the slogan of this country's self-destruction. That was not their only song, they had many others. The Nazi party's own anthem was written by a disreputable young stormtrooper named Horst Wessel. Goebbels had been looking for a poet, a musician, to provide a revolutionary song. At length, he found this young scoundrel, who was a consort of prostitutes. He was the leader of the SA in his neighborhood. The gang of hoodlums murdered him in 1930, and he then became a national hero of the up-and-coming Nazi party. Horst Wessel left behind him a rousing marching song, and we now hear his stormtrooper companions as they sing Die Fahnehawk, Raise the Banner. 
streets for the brown battalions. With this song, the stormtroopers marched, bringing death and destruction to mankind. Hitler's banner was raised, and free men everywhere were horrified at what was happening. How could these men sing so happily while they murdered millions? One of their most significant songs of propaganda was Heil Hitler did. It glorified the Fuhrer and his Nazi party and spread hatred against all those who were against the new order. We now hear the men of Stormtroop 33 sing this awe-inspiring Heil Hitler, dear. Hail Hitler to thee. <laughs> Thank you. 
responsible for these songs was Dr. Paul Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi party's minister of propaganda. He worshipped his leader, Adolf Hitler, and devoted his entire life to him. We hear him now as he introduces Hitler to a crowd of cheering Nazis. Yet, in the stunde ernstester Entscheidung, wiederholen wir es for Ihnen aus vollem und starken Herzen. Wir grüßen Sie, mein Führer, mit unserem alten Kampfruf. Aber bitte, Sie fallen! The crowds continued to cheer, and the stormtroopers continued to march into Poland, Czechoslovakia, Norway, Vienna, killing the innocent, destroying their lands, and always their crimes were set to music, marching music.
values have changed. You shouldn't be surprised. The ancient geeks ate their servants, we throw away light bulbs. In fact, practically speaking, you're not paying any more. You're getting less. Don't you remember? What was five is two. What was two? Shaninai,你总说你有四个儿子,怎么我们就看见四龙一个人呢?
The day was July the 13th, 1956. It was a Friday. At early afternoon, one of the Russian radar operators, those controlling the Hungarian air territory, noticed a very strange phenomenon. A commercial airliner on a routine flight from one Hungarian city to another all of a sudden disappeared from the radar scope. The plane answered no calling signals and the Russian jet fighters who were sent to find this plane discovered no trace of it. It had become a mystery, which grew until 7 p.m. of the day. The first one to report was a West German radio station in a special bulletin that a Soviet-Hungarian airliner made an unscheduled landing at a NATO Air Force base near Ingolstadt, Germany. Most of the passengers been hospitalized in serious condition. Those were the first words. And with this beginning, the most fantastic story in the history of aviation unveiled, hitting the front page of every newspaper around the world, being written up in every major magazine and broadcasted by every television network around the world. This airliner was hijacked in flight over Hungarian territory in the most dramatic mid-air struggle. I was the member of that hijacking team, and here is what happened. 
We boarded a plane in Budapest. Its destination was another Hungarian city near to the Iron Curtain. Our aim and determination was that the plane never will land in Hungary. Our aim was to take over the control, but we knew that among the passengers there is a well-armed secret policeman. His identity was unknown to us. Our plan was to knock down and knock unconscious every passenger, hoping that the secret policeman is among them, then disarm him, take his gun, break into the pilot cabin, and force the crew at gunpoint to give up the control. Twenty minutes before landing time, we moved into action. The airplane was flying at 10,000 feet, quietly. Most of the passengers were peacefully reading their papers when we struck. Within seconds, 14 passengers were knocked out of their seat and most of them were lying unconsciously on the floor of the cabin. We were ready to make the next move into the pilot cabin. But then all of a sudden, something unexpected happened. The door between the cockpit and the passenger cabin opened up. Somebody peeked out. Then before we knew, I was shot. And the next moment I knew that it is the end. The huge plane went into a deep dive. And the inside of that cabin became somewhat like a spaceship. As the plane was tumbling down with an accelerated speed, people, luggage, seats came loose and began to float. Now all of a sudden the plane turned upward, sharply. Everybody and everything hit the floor like a shot bird. For a moment, there was a crawling, moaning, bleeding, agonizing people on the floor, and the circle started all over again. The plane was going into another deep dive. For one moment, I saw George. He was prying the door of the cockpit with a screwdriver. George was the leader of our team. Then everything started to spin around me. I tried to move, I tried to go forward to help George, but everything went black. When I came to, the plane was still tumbling. George already broke into the pilot cabin where he found the man we knocked down 14 passengers for, the secret policeman. He had the loaded gun in his hand, his fingers were on the trigger, ready to kill. But then, then a hand much stronger than that of the secret policeman, much stronger than any human hand ever can be, reached there and said, no. I was the hand of God. The gun misfired, George jumped the secret policeman, and there a fight for life and death begun. For long, desperate moments, George could get no help from the rest of our team. By the time we were able to move forward, he was bleeding from more than a dozen open wounds, and most of us was lying with broken legs, arms, or cracked heads. The plane was approaching a cornfield, ready to make an emergency landing. The earth seemed to rush toward us with a tremendous speed. The land, down there, just a few hundred feet away, it was still the land of darkness and slavery. Our homeland, Hungary, and only seconds away. Four hours later, our journey came to its end. Ironic it may sound, but after the plane landed, we lived through moments which were tenser and more fearful than those during the desperate, hopeless struggle we had aboard the plane over Hungary. This is what happened. After flying across the Iron Curtain, we have decided not to land in the neighboring Austria, but keep on flying to western Germany, several hundred miles west. But we had no maps, we had no navigation, and then at one point we had no more fuel either. At 6 p.m. the plane touched down on the runway of an empty airport, and none of us really knew what country it was. Without navigation, we could have strayed over any country. 
It could have been at either side of the Iron Curtain. The plane came to a stop. I was one of the first to climb out. The airport was empty and completely deserted. We began to unload the plane. The tension in our hearts was growing into an immense fear. What country is this? Then, just as an answer to our question, from the end of the airport came a car. As it was coming closer and closer, the moments were almost unbearable. My heart was going wild, beating like a drum. My knees were trembling. There was a tremendous silence all of a sudden all around us. And in this deep, frightening silence, the car was driving up. It felt like that an eternity has fallen on us. Then all I can remember that I was on my knees. I didn't know how I got there, but I was kneeling on the concrete in the dust and tears were pouring down on my face. I don't know when it started. But they were tears with a taste I never had before, joy and happiness. The car was already there and through my tears I looked at it again. Yes, it was true. Blown by a gentle wind and the aerial of the car, there it was. The flag with the stars and stripes. I couldn't take my eyes off anymore. Some wonderful, unexplainable feeling was rushing through my body, through my bones, through my bloodstream. It was something like a chill. It was something like a cold shiver. Yet, it was something wonderful. A feeling I never had before and never since. It was a physical joy of experiencing freedom for the first time in my life. It was a physical joy of understanding and feeling freedom at first time after spending a quarter of a century in darkness and in slavery. For me, darkness and slavery ended. But this darkness didn't start it out as such. It started out as a dream back in 1945. And not only for me, but for nine million Hungarians who were left behind by a terrible war, by fascism, Nazism, and all of that destruction. When April 1945, the war ended, our people understood that there is a job to do to rebuild the destruction-torn land. Our main concern became how to rebuild the country and how to create a better life for our people. Politics, it wasn't our concern. Communism was even less. And the Hungarians wanted no part of communism. The Communist Party is less than a token force. They have less than 200 members. We are going to have free elections. We are going to have other political parties to choose from. We are going to have prosperity. Our churches are going to be open. We are going to have a better life. Communism, now it was no concern. The year was 1945, the year which marked the beginning of the dreams of nine million Hungarians. The dreams which ended less than five years later. 1949, the Communist Party of Hungary came into unrestricted and full power. And during those five years, we had free elections. We had other political parties to choose from. We had prosperity, as a matter of fact, prosperity wasn't the increase, and we never had it so good. And in the meantime, the occupying Soviet forces didn't even have to fire a single shot. And yet communism was there as a brute reality. What happened? You see, our nation had a history of a thousand years. It might be true that we didn't enjoy freedom much, but if any nation had the desire to have freedom and any nation had the guts to fight for, we did. During those thousand years, we were the defense of Western Europe. We were the Far East outpost of Western civilization. We kept the barbarians who were coming from the East, the Turks, the Tatars, the Russians. And our nation kept fighting and kept bleeding while the rest of Western Europe prospered. Our history is and was an endless 
fight for freedom. An endless fight for freedom which we have never given up. And now, for the modern day barbarians, it took only five years. And the light of that freedom which we fought for, which our fathers, forefathers died for, and which we cherished, was just blown out. What happened? You can ask again. The history of those years between 1945 and 49 is a terrifying one. We have been deceived. We have been deceived so tremendously. We thought that the criteria of the communist takeover are the firing squads, the machine guns, the concentration camps. And we felt that until we see these typical hallmarks of communism and totalitarianism, we don't have to worry. Then it was time to learn a very bitter lesson. 1949 we're dead. The first one was that communism never comes in and never takes power by using terror and bloodshed. It uses that only to stay in power. Communism, as every other totalitarian system, beginning with the popular things like the land reform in 1945. With the promise of social reforms, by appropriating the land and redistributing the wealth of the country, by promising everybody a leisurely life, by promising everybody prosperity, and in the meantime creating an all-powerful government with the consent of the people to do all these very noble and humanly sounding things for them. And I remember when our people were giving and giving and giving more and more power to the government, because after all, we believe that this thing should be done for us by our government. And as the government, which, mind it, was not a communist government, at least it wasn't on the surface because then nobody would trust it, government was growing and growing. And as it was assuming more and more control over the life and the property of the people, simultaneously the Communist Party was assuming more and more power over the government and consequently over the people. I was trained systematically by the Communists to be a leader someday. I think I can speak with some authority on the Communist strategy. And if I had to describe the most important field where the Communists concentrated their effort and their deceptive methods to succeed the takeover, the most, I would describe this field with one word, government. I'm convinced that the major factor in our own enslavement was the fact that we, the Hungarian people, had a false attitude and a false concept and understanding what the government should be. Now, you see, it was our own government, our own lawfully elected so-called representative or coalition government, which had done the major job for the communists, which the communists themselves could never do, and this job has been done for them in the name of the people. It was a Hungarian non-communist coalition government, which in the early stage liquidated the truly anti-communist elements, it was this government, this coalition government, which signed the death sentence of more fine Hungarian patriots, thousands of them, calling them fascists and Nazis and war criminals, while the true Nazis and the true war criminals and the true executioners were moving right into where they belonged to, the Communist Party. It was our government which established socialism there and destroyed the basic human rights, including the most important or one of the most important ones, to own property. It was our own government which, under the false label of progress, was gravitating more and more to the left. And while on the scene it was just a socialist progressive government, behind the front, the most ruthless power in the political arena was already emerging to take command whenever the situation becomes right. The communists didn't have to destroy the moral fiber of our country. The leftists and the socialists have done the job for them. They were the ones who destroyed patriotism of our young people, who destroyed the respect for law and order, the belief in God, the individual responsibilities and rights. 
They were the ones who eliminated and ridiculed and forced out of our school the name of God, the love of country. And even though that more Hungarian kids received education than ever before, it wasn't an education anymore. It had become a training ground for the social revolution to come, which social revolution was to be led by us, the young and the brave generation. I was a high school student in those days, and I remember very clearly, practically for every move they made. We were told that in this new social revolution, we are going to be the leaders, and this new kind of world is going to be the kind of world we, the young people, are going to make it. All we have to do is just to destroy the old, outdated, reactionary system first. Of course, we were eager to do it. We were idealists. We wanted to have a new life, a new land, and a new order. And at that point, nobody told us what Lenin said. Quote, demoralize the youth of the land, and the revolution is already won. You see, while in our everyday life prosperity was on the increase, but the moral fiber was attacked and undermined and finally destroyed, and at the same time, simultaneously, the government level was centralization of the power which being stepped up. Then things came to its end. The coexisting, cooperating fellow travelers knew and realized what is going on by now, and after digging into the public treasury assuring the leisurely days for the rest of their lives began to escape from the country. One after the other of the coalition leaders, the so-called coalition leaders whom we trusted and believed to be the leader of our country, elected leaders of ours, traveled to the Western European countries for conferences never to return. Yes, the ship was sinking and the rats were leaving it. In 1949, August the 20th, the inevitable came. The first traditional stage of the communist plan, which they called a takeover, has been completed with a deadly accuracy. And this is what the communists call the establishment of the classless society. This is traditionally the second stage of communism. You see, the first stage they are um, operating behind front organizations and they're using deception as their main strategy. Then they get into power and then it the second stage, the establishment of the classless society begins. The Iron Curtain went up, the minefields with the machine gun towers were erected, and behind the barbed wires, where nine million Hungarians had a dream for five years, the land became that of the terror, tears, and blood. It had become a damned land. The first step of the Communist Party done was to outlaw every organization, civic, religious, political, or otherwise, Boy Scouts and Masons, and you name them. The second step was to liquidate the class alien elements. Comrade Reva, he said, quote, rendering innocuous the agents of the imperialist and the class alien elements within is a necessary part of our work to establish the world of socialism. Since the communist revolution has been completed, there was no need for the fellow travelers anymore. So the communist party decided that they have to go. It was even ironic. But the first public execution was administered to Leslie Reich at October 15, 1949, less than two months after the communists took over. Leslie Reich was a communist himself responsible for the establishment of the Hungarian secret police. But the line of those who followed him was an endless line. Darkness descended upon our land. Fear and terror became everybody's companion for 24 hours a day. And the land became a jungle of inhumanity with scared, running human beings as the animals in it. The sole aim of the human beings became how to survive. It had become a life with no mercy. I don't think that anybody with any kind of vocabulary can ever tell you the atrocities and the fear and the terror which was in our land. I have seen people 
in their age of 70, their age of 80, people who have never committed any crime in their life. I have seen them dragged into a concentration camps because they were classified as class alien elements. And there they were now, working 12 hours a day, doing one of the most popular things in a concentration camp they've done, breaking rocks. And after 12 hours a day work, they were lined up in a long line to get their once a day meal, a hot boiling soup. The particular about was that it was served right into their bare palms. I have seen these people with their shaking, hands and palms, as they learned in their old days how to drink and how to eat hot boiling soup from their bare palms, just to survive, because the sole purpose of the human life became how to survive. 1952, less than three years after the Communist Party completed a takeover and was in full control of every facet of life, they decided to make the biggest step. And that was to socialize the agriculture and to take away every acre of privately owned land from the people, from the same people who were getting this land in 1945 with the help and with the slogan of the Communist Party who said that this land belongs to you people and we the Communists are giving it to you and we the Communists are going to stay here and make it sure nobody takes it away from you. And that was the deception, because less than seven years later, the same Communist Party came and said that the land belongs to the state. And the Hungarian people were not willing to accept this, and there was almost a revolution in the making. But the Communist Party Central Committee made a quick decision. The decision was that the Hungarian people have to learn a lesson. A lesson that the Communist Party means business. I went to the University of Chemical Engineering in that year, and that day I was home, my first vacation. My parents lived in a small village. It was the first night, and something around midnight woke me up. It was a very strange sound. I sat up in my bed, I looked around in the room, scared, I tried to reach over to my parents' bed. It was empty. I looked around in the room and my eyes got used to the darkness of it. I saw my father. He was at the window. He was peeking out from behind the edge of the curtain. Then I saw my mother. She was kneeling next to her bed and she was praying. Love. In the meantime, I recognized the strange, indeed, strange sound. It came from a truck. According to my knowledge, nobody had any kind of automobile in the village of 4,000 people. It was a silent spring night. It was pretty close. My mother's prayer went loud. She cried, God, God, she said, save us. And all of a sudden, she dropped her voice, and a tremendous silence sat in the room. The truck arrived at the front of our home, and then it stopped. The engine was still running. We were listening in this dramatic silence. All we could hear was this slowly idling engine. Around and around it went. It was the most fearful sound I ever heard in my life. Fish! 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 is Albert Groby. Prepare yourself for the shock of your life. 
You are about to come face to face with the most monstrous crime of all time. For this is the story of a demagogue, a demoniacal genius with criminal sadistic proclivities and his ruthless cohort participants. A story about a gang of killers who embarked on a mass annihilation of millions of human beings. This is a story compounded of human degradation beyond comprehension. A highly organized scheme which used every device known to modern science, but deliberately twisted for the infliction of agonizing torture, of awesome power built on mountains of human corpses. This is the revolting story of Adolf Hitler, the Nazi party, and National Socialism a movement nurtured by a savage determination to ravage and destroy, a movement that bathed itself in an ocean of human blood. That was Ade Polenland, a typical gay German march that the Nazis played at mass rallies. Happy, isn't it? But there's nothing happy about this story. From the very beginning, it was a tale of horror. From the very beginning, the sanctity of human life was violated. It all started after the First World War, when Adolf Hitler took over the National Socialist German Workers' Party and outlined a program aimed at building a super state. We demand the union of all Germans in a great Germany. Only those of German blood can be citizens. We demand that Roman law be replaced by German law. We demand the formation of a nationalist army so that Germany can fulfill her destiny. Thus spoke Adolf Hitler before a crowd of 2,000 disgruntled Germans in the Festsaal of the famous Hofbra House in Munich. It was 1920, and all kinds of discontented people were taken in by his program. When his program was all set, Hitler started to line up his followers. First, he organized the Brown Shirts, 
or stormtroopers whom he planned to use as shock troops. Next, he formed a defense corps, a small personal bodyguard, which was known as the Black Shirts. Their insignia was a death's head. Then he designed a flag, in the center of which was a black hooked cross, the swastika. This was supposed to symbolize the superiority of the Aryan race. The Nazis promised miracles, and they accompanied their promises with music, martial music that was appropriate for millions of goose-stepping Germans, music that began with a fanfare and thundering drums, music that inflamed people with wild patriotic fervor, music like this march played by a Nazi stormtrooper band. <laughs> First, instead of military might, the Nazis glorified the worker. They hoped that by doing this, they would strengthen Germany for war. Arbeit macht frei. Work makes one free, was their slogan. And in this way, they hid their true purpose, to enslave the entire world. With master strategy, they seized control of every branch of the German government. They took away civil liberties, destroyed all who stood in the way. They found that music could help incite beast-like behavior, could rouse the desire to kill, pillage, rape. There were songs describing Jewish blood spurting under the knife, songs urging the destruction of Catholicism, Songs that glorified a common criminal, Horst Vessel, a hoodlum who died violently in a street fight and was made a national hero in what became the official Nazi anthem. Just listen to the melody. It's quite appealing. It's warm, almost heroic. But bear in mind that it fomented the most vicious kind of cruelty like an instrument of evil.
And a man who was born to be a dictator has a right to step forward. This is what Adolf Hitler told a court in Munich in 1924 when he was tried and convicted of treason. Later, during nine months spent in prison, he wrote Mein Kampf, a testament of hate. The masses of people do not reason, Hitler declared in his book. Like animals, they are driven forward by fanaticism and hysteria. Hitler knew exactly how to encourage fanaticism and how to generate hysteria. None were more fanatically committed to their grisly plan of murder than the company he gathered around him. Sadists, trained killers, Known perverts and drunkards, all of them. Here are a few of the important ones being introduced to a huge Nazi party rally at the Berlin Sportpalast by Rudolf Hess, Minister of the Third Reich. Notice the enthusiastic response and obvious enjoyment of the crowd as each Nazi speaks. Dank Ihrer Führung wird Deutschland sein Ziel erreichen. Heimat zu sein. Heimat zu sein für alle Deutschen der Welt. Sie waren uns der Garant des Sieges. Sie sind uns der Garant des Friedens. But what I'm really seeing is another human being Just like me, trying hard to be free Whoever calls another a dirty communist mother Is living in the past somehow He's afraid of now He's all involved with money Well now paying bills ain't funny And you can't live by bread alone Oh, son! 
要帮半夜来思念战友，一草长也不知转矣，在何方？军民们。准备反杀武当，村里分批火一刀，赶豺狼、伤员们，日夜盼望真金庄，为的是杀我曹，回去。是申请归队，都这么性急。好，叶排长，我看一部分同志伤已经好了，可以先走。是，走，上哪儿去？我们找部队去啊！找部队去，那哪儿成啊？同志。乡<笑>亲们若有怠慢处，说出来我就去批评他。沙奶奶，沙奶奶，叫咱们替见，替见。沙奶奶，我给您提个意见呢。给我提意见，好啊，提吧，好吧，沙奶奶，您听着，大一天，同志们，把火拉，在一起议论你。七嘴八舌，不停口。哦，意见还不少呢。一个个伸出拇指。条理真不差，从不讲戏，不听手，一日三餐有一下。同志们说是这样，扛起来住下
只怕是心也宽，体也胖，路也走不动，山也不能爬，怎能上战场？大地上有你瞧得说呢，待<笑>等同志们上船，一上船一夜不转。离开我家，叫你们一日三餐，九<笑>碗饭，一觉睡到日西下。帮油炸，一个个向左黑铁塔，到那时身强力壮，阔战马，驰骋江南把地山，消灭汉奸，清匪把大的那日本强盗回老家，等到那。再来探望你这个命的老妈妈。<笑>
evil sound. A hideous sound? It was a bad sound. All right. <laughs> Would you reproduce that sound here for us tonight? Breedy. A little louder. <laughs> Now, a little louder, I won't... Breathe! There it is, my friends. That's the sound of the communist frog. Now, if you ever hear that sound in your neighborhood, I want you to squash it, kill it, snap yeah, it, right. burn it, destroy yeah, it. Wait, wait, wait. It might be me explaining to people. <laughs> well, we can't take that chance. Now, what happened?
道。我佩服你沉着机灵有胆量，竟敢在鬼子面前耍花枪。若无有抗日救国的好思想，也能够设计就真不慌张。参谋长，就要扭花枪，设计救人不敢当，开茶馆，喊兴旺将晦气。长爱王，想必是安排照应更周详。不争。
Märkische Heide, a favorite German march played by one of the official Nazi party bands. Heroic music for a super race. But music wasn't the only device Adolf Hitler used to stage an impressive show. There were flashy uniforms, fancy medals, elaborate decorations, torchlight parades, huge bonfires, athletic exhibitions, and extermination camps. At first, thousands of unsuspecting victims were taken into what the Nazis called protective custody. But this was not what the Nazis really wanted. And so they devised what they called the final solution. Death camps, Auschwitz, Buchenwald, Belsen, Dachau, Sachsenhausen, Treblinka, Helmno. Terminal points built with electrified barbed wire, gas chambers, and crematoria. There were 30 extermination camps scattered throughout Western Europe, and in these, the German butchers carried out their gruesome blueprint of slaughter. Men and women, boys and girls, children and infants in their mother's arms, none were spared. It was typical to hear a band playing something gay and gemütlich, while tens of thousands of men, women, and children were sent to choke to death in gas chambers and then burned in huge ovens. Generally, the musicians were concentration camp inmates themselves, forced to perform in fear of their own lives while their comrades marched to their doom. <laughs> This is the fiendish mind that only yesterday gave terrible and personal new meaning to words like gas oven, genocide, purge. This is the devil whose underlings, with sadistic delight, butchered the body of Willie Schmidt, a harmless music critic, by mistake, and sent his battered corpse home in a sealed coffin to a grieving widow and her young children. This is the cunning mastermind that promised German youth. Today, Germany. Tomorrow, the world. And incidentally, he meant your world. Here he is, speaking at a mammoth rally in a Munich arena filled with 75,000 of his worker servicemen, as he called them. An additional 200,000 persons hear his voice on the outside, blasting over loudspeakers. The faithful catch his fire. They scream for blood. The Fuhrer's tempo quickens. He becomes wild with excitement. And animal tempers are ignited. Man kann nicht dem untreu werden, was einem ganzen Leben Inhalt, Sinn und Zweck gegeben hat. 
Es will nicht so etwas aus nichts, wenn diesem Gerde nicht ein großer Befehl zugrunde liegt. Und dem Befehl gab uns kein irdischer Vorgesetzter, den gab uns der Gott, der unser Volk geschaffen hat. an diesem Abend in jeder Stunde, an jedem Tag nur zu denken an Deutschland, an Volk und an Reich, an unsere deutsche Nation und das deutsche Volk siegt ein! Sieg ein. Quote, the final solution, unquote. This was the term the Nazis came to use for the annihilation of six million Jews. And meanwhile, millions of others died in the bloodbath of persecution and aggressive war that followed. 400,000 Americans, six million Russians, more than 357,000 Englishmen, 450,000 Frenchmen, six million Poles, 10,000 Norwegians, 150,000 Greeks, 5,000 Danes. 2,000 Catholic priests perished at the hands of the German Nazi terror. And through it all, through all this ghastly bloodletting, German workers and industrialists alike prospered and grew fat as they made machines for killing people more efficiently. The music kept pace. Just imagine this march, played here by a German army band, as a prelude to death for thousands of Nazi victims being machine gunned into huge mass graves. <laughs> The Nazis sang and talked about joy and freedom, of how work meant life. Meanwhile, they continued the cavalcade of death. By the hundreds of thousands, people were wiped off the face of the earth. Official Nazi orders under such circumstances called for, quote, special treatment, unquote. Torture, shooting, hanging by the neck with piano wire or from meat hooks, gassing, poisoning, Strangulation, freezing alive in ice water, forcing bodies to be burst apart by simulated high altitude in vacuum chambers, whipping and electrocution. Pregnant women were violated brutally or otherwise tortured. Women at the moment of childbirth had their hands tied and their legs strapped together. Distinguished Nazi doctors performed loathsome inhuman operations. People were injected with air, phenol, unmentionable animal secretions, just to see what would happen. Corpses were dumped into mass graves or burned in the gas ovens. Human skin was peeled from human bodies and made into lampshades. Bones were made into soap and ashes into fertilizer. And all the while, all the while, Hitler continued to preach his gospel of a master race and world conquest. Listen to him as he addresses almost a million fanatic followers at a Congress of the Nazi Party in Nuremberg.
Es wird stets nur ein Teil eines Volkes aus wirklich aktiven Kämpfern bestehen. Und ihnen wird mehr gefordert als von den Millionen der übrigen Volksgenossen. Für sie genügt nicht die bloße Ablegung des Bekenntnisses, ich glaube, sondern der Spur, ich kämpfe. Reichsführer's words become a paroxysm of frenzy. He becomes more guttural and more violent as he rouses the mob to fever pitch. Das Ziel aber muss sein, alle anständigen Deutschen werden Nationalsozialisten. Nur die besten Nationalsozialisten sind Parteigenossen. Es ist unser Wunsch und Wille, dass dieser Staat und dieses Reich bestehen sollen in den kommenden Jahrtausenden. Wir können glücklich sein zu wissen, dass diese Zukunft restlos uns gehört. Wenn die älteren Jahrgänge noch wanken werden könnten, die Jugend ist uns verschrieben und da fallen mit Leib und mit Leben.
you know, Adolf Hitler nearly made it. If he had pushed his luck in a slightly different direction, he might have won. And you and I, and our families, then would have died horribly. Like the 10 million souls who lost their lives, and the countless others who have been enslaved. The Nazis left the world a heritage of death and destruction, of tragedy and fear. For the brave fathers and helpless mothers and innocent children whose bodies were piled high on the pagan altar of Nazi Germany, there is no epitaph, nor is there retribution. A mere handful of the Nazi arch criminals have paid with their lives for their crime. Shamefully few have been brought to trial by the Germans. Today, Germans seem merely to be embarrassed. Most of them profess to know little or nothing about the carnage. But we know that they know. And we must beware of the future. For the rotten seed of Nazism is still implanted. And perhaps under some other name or some other guise, it could sprout again. and the wild exhortations of the world's most evil men serve as a ghastly reminder. Let it stand as evidence against the mass participation by the German people in the obliteration of the 10 million human beings who disappeared from the earth under the scourge of German Nazism.
Hitler continued his conquest. And we hear him now as he spoke in Vienna. The translator seems impressed by Herr Schickelgrub. You are hearing now Chancellor Hitler who just said a charge a change has taken place which we are witnessing today that it will be up to the future generations to value it. It has often been stated that we have to fulfill a mission. But now the Chancellor is explaining which mission shall and must be fulfilled. The Chancellor just referred to Austria as the East Mark and the bulwark in the East of the German Reich, which has been united into the German nation. His doctrine was spreading, and the rest of the world was preparing to stop this madman before it was too late, before the Marseillaise, God Save the King, and the Star-Spangled Banner were replaced by songs such as this. <laughs>
England and America declared war on Germany, and Hitler's days were numbered. His stormtroopers and his dreaded SS Defense Corps continued to march. Naturally, they must have a song. The SA with their shirts of brown and the SS dressed in black. These murderers continued to sing as the bombs fell. When the SS and the SA march away, firm is the step, firm is the step. One, two, three, four. Everyone wants to join. And so we march today in every little town. And all the German girls dream of us because the black SS and the brown SA is what everyone loves today. It is the most beautiful thing in the world. We hear that song now when the SS and the SA march away. Not only did the men and women of Nazi Germany sing, but also their children. The Hitler Youth were a strong part of this struggle. They were taught to believe. Today, Germany, tomorrow, the world. They, too, had their marching songs. And we now hear the small Berlin schoolchildren as they sing of Youth on the March. <laughs>
Despite their rousing songs and hysterical speeches, the Nazis could not defeat the free world. In 1945, Hitler's banner no longer waved. Justice had triumphed, and Hitler and his gang were no more. In those last days in Berlin, the Führer and his disciple, Dr. Goebbels, took their own lives. But Goering, von Ribbentrop, Hess, and the rest were to be tried at Nuremberg as war criminals. We now hear their false cries of not guilty as the curtain falls on this bloody reign of terror, which we have called Hitler's Inferno. We now enter the courtroom at Nuremberg. I will now call upon the defendants to plead guilty or not guilty to the charges against them. Uh, they will proceed in turn to, the, to a point in the dock opposite to the microphone. Hermann Wilhelm Goering. Bevor ich die Fragen des Gerichtshofes beantworte, ob ich mich schuldig oder nicht schuldig bekenne, I inform the court, the, the court that defendants were not entitled to make a statement. You must plead guilty or not guilty. Ich bekenne mich im Sinne der Anklage nicht schuldig. of not guilty. If there is any disturbance in court, those who make it will have to leave the court. Joachim von Ribbentrop. Ich mich im Sinne der Anklage für nicht schuldig. Wilhelm Keitel. Ich bekenne mich nicht schuldig. In the absence of uh, Ernst Kaltenbrunner, the uh, trial will proceed against him, but he will have an opportunity of pleading when he is sufficiently well be brought back into court. Alfred Rosenberg. Ich kenne mich im Sinne der Anklage nicht für schuldig. Hans Frank. Ich kenne mich nicht für schuldig. Wilhelm Frick. Nicht schuldig. Julius Streicher. Nicht schuldig. Walter Funk. Nicht als schuldig. Yalma Schach. Ich bin in keiner Weise schuldig. Karl Grün. Ich 
Kenny, Miss Tony. Baldo, Montura. Ich bekenne mich im Sinne der Anklage als nicht schuldig. Because it was storefront synagogues. Now the gypsies are cooking there. Are gypsies too much, man? Whew. The gypsies are like, forget it, eh? Did you ever really know a gypsy? None of you really did. No, you knew them, but not really got down with them, man. The gypsies and Siamese cats are asses, man. It's, yeah, you can never really cook with them. Don't let the door open, that's it, man. Don't let the cats out, they're going, man. And gypsies, like... Thank you. 